Bases dropped on a Monday. So I guess we'll just call it a reaction Monday because we know that there are reactions out there. We know that you've got them. And that's what we are here to discuss. John here, Jared there. And thanks for uh, hanging out with us here on SDH on a Monday. And uh, Jared, you know, we could do the the opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Uh, kickoffcoffeeco.com. And you can get uh, Kickoff Coffee and follow them at Kickoff Coffee CO at Twitter, Facebook, and the Gram, as the kids say these days. And, you know, if you decided to get your Kickoff Coffee and you use the code Soccer Down Here 15, you could get 15% off your coffee. And then they, in turn, take 10% of the proceeds, reinvest them into the youth game, which is very, very cool stuff. And once again, thanks to our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Banner off to my right and uh, at the halfway point. We'll talk about the friends over my left shoulder. But uh, I think, you know, we can get into the numbers and we'll get into the numbers for the player rankings and things like that. But if if you had to choose a particular topic, and I will leave this to the floor, that uh, if for the opening kickoff, what should it be on a Monday? If you If you were in charge of topics for opening kickoffs, what specifically would you address this morning? Hmm. Is, it, um, is it that easy? I mean, because I mean, there's the there is the topic out there, and obviously, a lot of folks have gotten into it. This I don't end. have the cholesterol. Well, for to keep discussing Joe Dickerson being bad at his job and pro handing Joe Dickerson that game again, because um, y'all can get in my mentions all day long about pro or about. Um, you know, how Atlanta needs to do this, that, or the other, and pros just doing their job. But, man, I don't have the cholesterol to deal with that today. It's Well, I, you know, well, that's why I, that's why I take Crestor 20 every morning, you know. I, I literally have Crestor 20 to take care of stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, but I'm uh, – I shouldn't need it. I'm, I'm still in my mid th- my early 30s, mid-30s, I, know. I guess. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, You know, when you're – it's first and foremost, the notion that pro thought it was a good idea to assign Joseph Dickerson to a team where the last time that he was assigned to a team, although it was uh, in that team's own building, there was a situation created by his own doing and his decision to, I guess, for lack of a better word, bow up on a, an Atlanta United player. And Pro thought it was a good idea to, to assign him to another it, state. Okay, so, so it's not even – okay, so it doesn't even matter to me that it's he, he, he did an Atlanta game because that's going to happen. You only have so many refs and it's going to rotate. And that's fine. It's the matchup. It's the fact that the last time these two teams got together, um, it got chippy. It got weird. The, the chemistry they created was kind of weird. He didn't really manage it well. And then you had the blow up at the end. And, yeah, you got – Almada has to control – Amada can't go squaring up on a ref. We've been over that. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. But you're, you're, he was going to get another Atlanta game. That's fine. It's the fact that last time these two teams played and he had it, and it kind of got a little sideways. Well, it got sideways again. Mm-hmm. Like, in, And so someone asked me, like, what do you want him to do? They only have so many refs. Like, flip him with someone else. I don't really care who it is. Yeah. But last time he had this, these two teams, it got sideways. So put him somewhere else. Flip him with one other person. This is not building a 162 game schedule. This is, oh man, he's covering that game. What happened last time they played? Uh, let's put him in Colorado and bring whoever's in Colorado. Bring Ishmael Alfath here or Baltimore Toledo for God's sakes. I don't really love Baltimore Toledo as an official. Yeah. Like bring bring one of those guys in to do it. Uh, just because the just because this this chemical reaction was was weird last time and it was again last night and and it's not just and just so we're clear like it's not just the Santi Sosa thing or the handball but it's like even late in that game where the line for what was a foul was moving the line for what was a card was moving guys were getting frustrated on both sides benches are getting frustrated it's such a weird some teams some team you get styles make fights and sometimes you get weird combinations that's what you got when these two teams played it won't be like that every game. Joseph Joseph Dickerson will get other Atlanta games, and he'll be fine, I'm sure, because every ref has good days and bad days. But it just felt like you were 
it, it's a, it, you, you put yourself in a situation where you could have had a problem again and you didn't have to, you know, you, you hit your nail, you, you hit your thumb with a hammer when you didn't need your thumb to be sitting next to the nail. You had options. I actually did that this weekend, by the way, L- literally uh, as uh, part of the uh, assembly. Of, have you, when was the last time you assembled a piece of furniture? Um, it was like a couple months ago. Okay. Uh, then because the, the boss and I had to assemble a piece of furniture for uh, the mother-in-law and it was one of those where you had to have the, the Phillips head screwdriver that had like the, the, like the one thirty second, and all we had was like the one sixteenth. And so you're trying to, to make sure that you could screw things into a console with uh, a, 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 Phillips head that was too large and you know we had no options and so it took about five hours to assemble a console for the mother-in-law for her new television so uh, yeah that was kind of what we were trying to do and and making sure that you could uh, screw the the screws inside the the particle board and all they do is they give you that the surface area to do it they didn't give you the the depth and you had to kind of create depth on your own and so that was where the whole hammering thing Started for me. So, yeah, I, I got to do that this weekend and uh, expose my thumb to a hammer. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's it was just like the way he it's 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 for me, it's with Dickerson. It's a lot of times it's the way he manages it. The line kind of moves throughout the game. And that's the that's the issue. Like, because we've seen this and I've pointed out when we do twos games that there have been twos games where, you know, it might not be perfect. But I love to see make sure that ref is communicating early on with fouls, like communicate where the line is, and then keep the line there. Like it can be loose, it can be tight. Just keep it consistent. We do this in baseball all the time in the strike zone. So guys can have weird strike zones, but as long as it's consistent, and you can adapt to it. That's fine. It's when the line starts jumping around. Uh, Mosquito's getting like a weird yellow card with his first foul. Yeah, his game. first foul, he gets um, a year. And then I think I forget who it was. Uh, for, for Columbus gets one a couple minutes later that was like his first or second foul. And it wasn't egregious. It was just a foul. Like it was, it was just, he, I think he stabbed at the ball and missed. Yeah. And it was, it wasn't even egregious. And so you had yellow cards on both teams that were unnecessarily given. And like, I don't know if he felt like the game was getting out of control and that was his way to get it back under control. It was just so weird, man. But, um, but if it's getting the, out and, but if it's getting out of control, it's because of your own devices and your own inconsistency. And therefore, I mean, and if this is the, the logic that I'm following here, as those of us who are watching a match, inconsistency yields itself to overcorrection. It does. And, every, and people are talking about on the, in the uh, Twitch pitch about it. And I guess here's where I sit on it. If you want like a, I don't know, like a quick summary of it. For me, if you get people back to functioning on defense next year, which that involves, you know, having a veteran goalkeeper who marshals the back line and having better defensive performances, the front end of that in the midfield, which, dude, we got to talk about a Marsadich because yeah. um, for as much as we criticize some of these moves around this front office and some of them haven't worked, man. I'll tell you what, they do a damn good job finding finding some steals within the league, whether it's Justin Miram back in the day when his value was just cratered mm-hmm. after the Orlando days. Um, or whether it's getting a Marsadich for not a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, Marsadich went out there and was that... He, 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 uh, if you pulled out the x-ray, he had that dog in him. Yes. And it was very much there. But if you're getting that kind of performance out of your front line and your midfield, then I certainly like the chances of this team going forward if you can just clean up those individual moments on the back line that have hounded you all year long. And part of that, I think, is the idea that yeah, you're thinking sometimes instead of Juan Parata or instead of Alan Franco in those moments – might be Miles Robinson stopping yeah. that 1v1. Um, you know, Brad Guzan, you're thinking, might might have the back line marshaled onto, onto step a little bit faster or might be able to reach one. It, it just, it's, 
it's frustrating because now that you because because of performances like that like yeah. red bulls was frustrating in a different way because you started out well in the first 10 minutes 15 minutes and then you made mistakes that you can't make against that team and then the you know the the rest of that red bulls game because i haven't talked to you since then i don't think yeah. about that game is right. You know, yeah, Atlanta controlled the game. Of course they did. You Red Bulls had a two goal lead. They were happy to let you control it. Mm-hmm. They didn't need to do anything. They had a two goal lead. Yep. Styles make fights, goals change games. Red Bulls had a two goal lead. Of course they didn't want the ball. They didn't need the ball. Atlanta was able to dominate possession and try and dominate shots and dominate key passes because Red Bulls was generally fine with that. Because yeah. they can set up a bit of a mid block. If you turn it over, they can go and otherwise they'll absorb your pressure. They had a lead, they didn't but, care. You can have the ball. Do what you want. Yeah. But the fact that the, the 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 schizophrenia is frustrating with this team because you get games like that, and then you get games like last night where uh, you get two goals. Um, first of all, man, like mm-hmm. Caleb Porter's got to go talk to God or something about the fact that they can't spend set pieces. Look, Atlanta's gotten better on corners this year. Um, that's something I I was thinking about during the game. Is I think they've gotten infinitely better on set pieces because they're not bomb scare anymore defensively on them. They're dealing with them better. And I don't know if that's a one-off because Columbus is bad on set pieces. Columbus got to go talk to God though about set piece defense because Atlanta shouldn't be cooking you on set pieces. Atlanta, if if Atlanta gets you on a free kick where it's well-placed and, you know, somebody, you know, makes a run or whether it's put on frame with Almada or a guy like Brooks Lennon, that's one thing. But, you can't be getting cooked on corners by a team like Atlanta. And Columbus got absolutely abused on corners. Then Juanjo Parata goes in. Um, I think Parata missed one that flashed wide. They missed two or three yeah. that flashed just wide. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Santi Sosa one. Like you got abused on set pieces by by on corners specifically by a team that doesn't live by that. Like if Nashville's beating you like that, that's one thing. It, that's and the whole thing was just a giant red flag for Columbus's defending mm-hmm. that they they got out of there with only two goals. Um, for what it's worth, the Mosqueda goal, I I thought it was offside. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I I from the angle we got in broadcast, which it's not a good angle, man. It's the same thing we talked about with with uh, Gutman's goal in Chicago or Cincinnati, excuse me. Yeah, and it's the same same thing we talked about with the Red Bulls goal. When that camera's not straight on, man, it's so hard to tell. Mm-hmm. I thought he was off though, and they called it on the field. That wasn't getting. I didn't think there was nearly enough to overturn that. If he was on, it was even, and that's if I think he was off. But yeah, I mean, you it, 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 the schizophrenia on the attacking side was is frustrating because, and yeah, it, styles are going to be different. How are you going to deal with DC when they come in? That I imagine DC's going to sit a bit and ask you to go beat them, and they're going to try and break on you, but. Yeah, it was. It's frustrating because you get a game like Red Bulls where you just you start out hot and then you collapse in the span of, ten, of five ten minutes, and then the whole game state changes. But then you get a game like this where you played Columbus straight up, and this is this is what you needed to see. The problem is that it is so late in the season now, and you have practically no room for error. Great performance getting potentially screwed by a couple calls isn't isn't doesn't work for you. Isn't no. good enough. You needed three points. By hook or by crook, and you didn't get it. You needed three points against Red Bulls. You didn't get it. I thought Red Bulls was a must-win game. I thought this was a must-win game. Everything is must-win, and you you can't just I, 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 if you believe the season's over, that's fine. Um, I'm I've I've watched enough collapses in my life where until someone's mathematically eliminated, I just kind of. I, I can't close the door until it's mathematically eliminated, especially in MLS because this league is so stupid. Yeah. Um, I think they are all but done at this point. Um, you have to basically win out the rest of the way. And you were already in that position. You got a couple things that went your way. And that's one of the frustrations here is that you had a couple results that went your way. Like Miami beating Toronto was okay there. It kind of slows Toronto down. It's one of those teams you're running with. And Miami's in that conversation too, don't get me wrong. But you you had to get stuff here because I, I, I don't know if y'all check the schedule. You have 180 minutes with Philadelphia coming up. You have to go to Philly at one point, and then Philly comes to you. Mm-hmm. There's no guarantee you get Jack Squad out of those games. Yep. Now, you're not D.C., so I don't expect you to give up 13 goals in two games against Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah. follow Red Bull. Red Bulls have always bugged you. Philadelphia is likely to bug you as well, um, because Philadelphia is a very, very, very good team. Um, yeah, you are. You're not. You're not officially out of it, but that door is that door is closed, and you're searching for a key at this point for me. Yeah, right now uh, you are five points out of a playoff spot. You've got to jump five teams to get into the playoffs. You have eight matches to go, and uh, right now, like I said, and I'm I'm like you. I'm I'm somewhat pragmatic about it. Until there's a mathematical elimination, you're still chasing. And right yeah. now, like, you're, you're not gonna, guys aren't going to quit playing. That's no. they are professionals. They're going to they're going to they're going to keep playing because if nothing else, they're playing for to make sure that you know. They got bread on the table next year. Yeah. Uh, right now in the East, Orlando is on goal difference and by one goal ahead of Inter Miami, both at 10, 6, and 10. And it's minus seven to minus eight in goal difference right now with Orlando and Inter Miami. Columbus with the draws at 35. That's your playoffs. New England's at 34. Same record as FC Cincinnati. Minus two to minus three in goal difference right now. They're at 34 points. Charlotte's at 32. Toronto is at 30. And they have played one more match than Chicago. And they have one more win than Atlanta at minus four. So, uh, Turner, we have not played Philadelphia yet at all. We have two games of Philly home and away. Yeah. That's so. like the schedule, the way the schedule broke this year. You just, you have them late in the year. Yeah. Um, you wanted to be in a position to where those games didn't really matter. You were not in that position, obviously. Yeah. Um, it was a great fight last night. Uh, but let's, wasn't enough. Uh, yeah, total shots for Atlanta, 24-12. Shots on target, 10-8. Seven blocks for Atlanta. Ten corners. Uh, 19 fouls called on uh, Atlanta. And uh, uh, three yellows for the opposition, two for Atlanta. 82 percent possession and you mentioned uh, 12 tackles nine picks and 14 clearances and you wanted to you mentioned Amar Sadich and uh, getting into Sadich's numbers in 70 minutes yesterday two incomplete passes on 29 passes 35 touches two for three on his long balls had a shot on target one uh, one ground duel uh, had uh, one foul called on him had a tackle and a dribble passed so you know when you're looking for folks and looking for them to, to fit into your system. You get a guy like Amar Sadich, and he has been fitting in pretty, pretty well when he's been asked to. Uh, you mentioned uh, Juanjo Purata. Uh, six clearances, an, a pick, a tackle, a dribble passed, seven of nine on his uh, duels, and he won all five in the air. And he was, uh, he was called for a foul, 60 touches, 80% passing. 35 of 44, two key passes, two for five on his long balls, and one uh, successful dribble. So uh, just to, to give you an idea about the the guys that you bring in, the guys that you find, and I think that you look at uh, a guy like uh, Juanjo Purata, who was who was brought in, and it's like, hey, you know, we need help at the back. And I think that Purata has really solidified himself here, and especially on corners where you haven't had the, that presence in the air at times. And I think that Purata has given you that muscle – and the, the presence in the air on corner kicks. And you mentioned how Atlanta United has been, how had they have been on corners, and you have somebody like Purata that they bring in, and he's he's really assimilated pretty well pretty quickly. He has. He's done well um, defensively and offensively. Like defensively, I think the – I forget who posted the numbers a couple weeks ago, but their numbers defensively on, on aerial duels has gone up substantially with him. Um, he's, he's a different kind of player. And he's he's what you needed in that moment. It's a good job of the scouting department getting somebody on loan to try and patch it up. I think they've made they've did what they could because it is a salary cap league. You're limited on what you can and can't do. You brought in a guy on loan to kind of try and plug a hole. <laughs> he's he's done that for the most part. Um, he did exactly what he should have done last last night, though. I mean, because he's. You know, he makes a mistake on one of the goals. All you can do is try and make up for it. And he did. He went and scored a goal. Um, that's 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 the best way to make up for your mistakes is to go pull one, pull one back. Uh, but Paratis really helped stabilize that. It was a good job of bringing him out on loan, finding that, and making it work. And I don't know if he stays long-term or not. Um, 
I'd love him to. And if that's at the expense of Alan Franco, that's the expense of Alan Franco. Um, that's a different, that's a conversation for this off season. I would say that um, as we get into the off season, um, until we see what happens with the president side of things, I wouldn't tie myself to anything one way or another, or set my expectations one way or another, because we don't know who's going to, who's going to take that presidency. We don't know what their ideas are going to be. We don't know if they're going to want to change people around. Um, so kind of having, I think having like an outline for right now, for right now yeah. is just a fool's errand because we don't know who's going to come in. We don't know what their ideas are going to be. We don't know if they're going to want to make changes and where they might want to make changes. It's going to be, uh. It's going to be very interesting to see. So that's, yep. it's, that's, that's a, that's a worry for another day. Yeah. That, playoffs are a worry for today. Cause you're probably right. not getting into the playoffs unless something really weird happens. Yeah. So like I said, uh, you've got a handful of points to make up. You got some folks to leapfrog. You've got eight matches to do it. So that's, that's where Atlanta United is right now. Uh, I, I guess I'll call it, even though it's a, a continual topic on the, on the Twitch pitch. And thanks to everybody who is, Joined us this morning. Thanks to hanging out uh, on the Twitch pitch. But uh, that's that's been 20 minutes of your opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Kickoffcoffeeco.com. And you can also follow Kickoff Coffee on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. And also, a uh, reminder, Soccer Down Here 15. Spell it out. Soccer Down Here 15. Get you 15% off your purchase every time that you uh, want to have your Kickoff Coffee. And they, in turn, take 10% of the proceeds and reinvest it into the youth game. And uh, really, really cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. And I know that, yes, the conversation that we're having in the opening kickoff is going to continue out throughout the broadcast. Uh, in the post-match, uh, Gonzalo Pineda asked reporters to, to do their charge and continue to uh, question pro because you know well coaches can it's just that they would get fine suspensions and cards and so he has kind of asked us to uh do the do the charge and sit there and continue to hold pro accountable in situations like this and i think that and i saw it on the timeline last night from uh, a lot of supporters uh you know you know at pro referees i saw a lot of that activity and uh abby with the question on the twitch pitch and that'll lead things off this morning Abby wants to know, and I don't know if uh, we have an actual answer for this, Jared, but Abby wants to know what's the pro record for goals taken away from a single team in a season. Oh, I don't know, and I don't think we're going to run up on that. Um, here's the thing about it. I don't. I would assume you're not going to run up on that because the way the season has gone and the way everyone has clung to moments left, right, and center, and you're desperate for anything positive, those moments stick out in a much more stark fashion. Yeah. Um, we might not be talking or thinking about how many goals it is if it lands above the playoff line and in good shape, but because you're not in good shape and you're emotionally grasping at anything you can, those moments are going to be more, pro stick out more, more, more strongly in your head because you think about, you know, the penalty that wasn't giving in Miami uh, where, Pro came out and said, yeah, that was a mistake. They should have been given a chance to tie it and get a point out of that. Uh, you have yesterday as well. I, had person, I look forward to watching MLS Digital do the uh, do the instant replay. And uh, and I'll compare contrast that with what's said by, uh, by Pro next week. Because yeah. I don't know. Pro might come out and say, nope, it was handled correctly. Um, there was contact and he got the arm extended. Because, um, that, that, man, that one was weird. Because, yeah, Sosa gets his arm extended. Mm -hmm. The defender also goes full flailing, like prime Coach K Duke dive, <laughs> yeah. which he has to because yeah. he's beat at that point. Santi's got it measured. He does not have it measured. He feels contact and he flails the arms and he goes down. He's trying to sell it because that's all he can do in that moment. He can't get back and defend it. So he tries to sell it and it gets bought. He did exactly what I would expect an Atlanta United player to do in the same thing, which is you feel that contact. You're not going to get to it. Make try try and sell it and put put the onus on the official and he did and Joe Dickerson made the call. Yeah, did exactly what he needed to do in that moment because Santi Sosa had it measured and he did not have it measured. Did exactly what he needed to do. That's that at that point you're putting it on the onus of the official and one of those calls is I don't like it because there is hand fighting and pushing on literally every corner. Yeah. This is the same philosophy of of you could call holding on every plane football if you wanted sure. to. Yeah, you could. Um, but you put the onus in those moments on the official and you asked him to make a call and he did. It is what it is. 
Alex, but yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. I think. I think ultimately, like because of the state of the season, those moments are so fresh in our head, and they stick in our head in right. the concept of what might have been. No doubt. Uh, Alex Basin's asking, "What prompted Santi Sosa to suddenly have uh, five? I think five shots. It was five shots. What he said, he wanted it yesterday. So." This is something we talked about with Jack Collison with the twos a lot. Is uh, Omar Jeroen's one of the assistants with the twos, and I think he assists with the first team sometimes as well. It, when when the twos have had good games this year, and I know that's few and far between. Um, trust me, my mentions get lit up plenty about it uh, about them running kids out there. But when they've had their good moments, Jack Collison's quick to point out the work that they do in the week and what Omar Jeroen does as an assistant, helping get stuff ready. And between the corners that Atlanta United took advantage of last night. And the way Sosa was coming out of that midfield, I assume they saw something with Columbus that was there to get exploited with we can attack our set pieces this way. Man, they went back post a lot on those corners. Yeah. Uh, but, which if you think about it, go back to 2019, 2018, 20, I think it was 2018 or 2019, uh, Atlanta, Joseph scored a goal in Columbus and broke his nose in the process yes. going that back post header. Uh, that was more toward the six-yard box, but still, point remains. Yes. But the, I'm, I wonder if they just saw something in the way Columbus had played recently or last time against Atlanta that said, hey, if we, got, if we, can, put, if we can put someone like Sosa in that position and have him make the runs at that moment and make this happen, make that happen, at those moments, it's there to get exploited. Something changed that the staff saw and adjusted to. Santi's numbers yesterday in 90 minutes, 58 touches, 33 of 42 on his passing, five of seven on uh, long balls, two shots on target, three off, had a shot blocked as well, three for 10 on ground duels, one is only duel in the air, so four of 11 total, fouled once, one pick, two tackles, and a dribble pass. So a very full day for Santi Sosi yesterday uh, for uh, – for uh, Atlanta United. Uh, also on the board, you've got, uh, let's see, uh, Turner's in this morning. He says, listen, I'm a lifelong MLB fan. My view on officials is jaded, but is it wrong for me to have a low baseline bar for officials to reach the level of, quote, not total dog water, end quote, and have performances that make Angel Hernandez and C.B. Buckner blush? I mean, consistency is key. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for reminding me that CB Buckner is still an MLB uh, MLB umpire. <laughs> oh my God, Angel Hernandez is one too. But Angel Hernandez has sued Major League Baseball at least once yeah. about not getting a playoff series and claimed racial discrimination. To which Major League Baseball just went, "No, it's because you're bad at your job. We don't care. We don't care that you you know what your what your ethnicity is or what whether you were purple and polka dotted and glow in the dark. You're just bad at your job. So especially compared to your uh, your peers, so we're not going to give you the playoff series because you cannot be trusted to make a good call in a big moment. So, which, so, which then raises the question: Why the hell was uh, Tim McClellan give so, given so many? Because Tim McClellan was infamous for uh, for fumbling the ball, the big moments, including the George Brett bat incident. That is true. Uh, so then, uh, are we saying that uh, Joe Dickerson is the Angel Hernandez of Major League Soccer? Oh, I don't know about that. Um, Baltimore Toledo still exists. Okay, so so in that in that vein of Angel Hernandez and CB Buckner, as I guess is where we're going. That's the Isle of the Store that we have Joseph Dickerson at the moment. Uh, Wagner For these two teams, yeah, yeah. Like I said, like I said earlier, I think you'll get other games with Joe Dickerson and he'll be okay. Um, but man, maybe it's just the whatever the hell chemistry was that these two teams pre create when you mix them into a beaker. Um, it's not a game that fits what Joe Dickerson does. And I don't know if that's an Atlanta Columbus thing or what, but man, it just does not fit. He'll get other games with Atlanta. I'm sure. And he might be fine in those games. I hope he is because the only way that things get better is if they can improve. So I hope Dickerson does improve. Yeah. I'm very annoyed with his, uh, with his work over the last two times yeah. we've seen these two teams play, but I hope he does improve because that's the only way it's ever going to get better. Yeah. Uh, Wagner goes yesterday. Joe had a bad day. Dunga is in dunga goes joe dickerson is a problem bar is problematic league-wide yeah i mean it's just 
it's inconsistency because you know, we've seen if you go ever look at the you know, pro uh, Friday or Saturday, usually pro referees um, on Twitter will post the video that uh, Greg Barkley does um, where they'll go over some of the calls. And then they also post the written out version of it. And you'll see every now and then where they'll you know talk about, you know, this was the call. This was the logic behind it. This is why it went to VAR. This was the logic behind the VAR decision. This was right or this was wrong. You see it more often, and you don't see it, it's not every week, but you see it more often than you like where it's where the answer comes back as they ruled this, VAR ruled this, they were both wrong. It doesn't happen every week, but it happens more often than you would like because you have vis- because you have video review. And if you're getting stuff wrong after video review, which gives you a moment to look at it, take a deep breath, maybe check the rule book if you need or, to. Or three and a half, but yeah. But but the fact that you have time to do that and you still get it wrong, that is unacceptable. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Wagner running through. Uh, Emilio, yeah, we talked about it here in the first half hour. Atlanta needs to – Dickerson's a problem for both teams. Atlanta needs to stop having possible mental lapses on defense. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I want to give part of that as well uh, because, yeah, you made mistakes on defense. Uh, the first goal is a really nice break down the right-hand side from Columbus. Like, that's a really good buildup. Um Cucho Hernandez has a lot of like 2017, 2018 Joseph in him. Not yeah. to say he's the exact same player because Joseph put up two seasons that and include 2019, three season, a three season stretch that I don't know will get equaled. Um, Cucho Hernandez has that in him where like where it was prime Joseph, where if you gave him half a chance, he was going to bury it. And that was that moment where, you know, you watch the build up of that first goal and you're like, oh, Atlanta's getting stretched here. Oh, that's a 1v1 on the back end mm-hmm. with that ball coming into the box. Kucher's going to put it away because it's the same feeling you had with Joseph during that time period. So there is a balance, I think, to be had with, yeah, Atlanta has to do better. Also, Kucho Hernandez is a stone-cold killer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's there's So for me, there's always that balance, and I don't know if you all feel the same way. It's totally okay if you don't, where, um, yeah, you absolutely made mistakes, and you have to be better in those moments. Um you cannot let you cannot let Sands cook you down the left side like he did. It's a great stiff arm, by the way, on Brooks Lennon. Um, but then you get beat further down that side, plays it into Cucho, and you don't. And Cucho makes something happen. They have two guys around him, and he finds space and gets the shot away and puts it in the back of the net. But you, he, he is taking advantage of the, with those half chances, which use what honestly is what Columbus has missed. Yeah, and you look at their results over the last month. I mean, he's helping them rescue points, doing that sort of thing, and it, so it's not it's not just Atlanta who's been victimized by Cucho Hernandez in the same way that it wasn't just Campana, who uh, it wasn't Atlanta that was victimized by Campana early in the season with Miami. He was really helping keep them afloat. Sometimes you uh, sometimes you run into guys that are stone cold killers, and when you make mistakes, you absolutely get punished for them. Sometimes you run into guys who were not stone cold killers, you make mistakes, and you get away with it. Cucho yesterday, uh, courtesy of our friends at SofaScore, 90 minutes, two goals, five shots on target. Five of his six were on target. Had a shot blocked. Three for four on his dribbles. Only had 20 touches in the first half. Had 25 in the second. 16 to 24 passing, so that's two-thirds. Three or four on long balls. Seven of 12 on his ground duels. Two for four in the air. So nine of 16 on duels overall. Uh was fouled four times and had one dribble pass. So yeah, Cucho Hernandez a nine point two yesterday on Sofa Score. Yeah, and uh, so Emilio pointed this out last night that like Atlanta was kind of getting victimized down the right side. So Columbus is attacking left. Well, I mean, it's where there were parts in the game, but that's where Cucho was leaking out to because he was on Atlanta put him on an island. Yeah, in part in chunks of the first half, like Atlanta put that man in hell on the first half. They isolated the hell out of him where he wasn't able to connect anything. And so he had to flare out there. And I think that's where you started getting those danger moments for them. And then Sands being part of that danger squad as well. Uh, I mean, which, was Sands, a, which was a surprise considering yeah. Sands came in cold because of the injury. And you figured that that was, that, that was going to be a focus on the attack and uh, of chasing after Sands before he got into the rhythm of the match. And, but, but that's what, then that's what you had is, you know, Sands kind of gave you a performance you didn't expect. Amar Sadich gave Atlanta a performance. Fans probably didn't expect him. Marseille has been kind of hot and cold this year, but when he's hot, man, a Marseille can get it done. Mm-hmm. But if he's not, but if it's not on for him, it, he struggled with it. So, 
it's it's interesting um because yeah sands sands was able to find some space down there and then yeah cucho hernandez had to leak out the left because he had to do something to get the ball otherwise he was sitting in hell he wasn't doing anything he they weren't able to get to him atlanta did a really good job of denying him and then he they have to make adjustments so columbus makes adjustments and atlanta makes adjustments i thought honestly um that was one of my favorite things about the Frank DeBoer era in Atlanta. I thought I felt like Frank DeBoer, when it came to adjusting in the middle of the game, was absolutely insanely good at it. I lost track of how many times he made changes, be it personnel or shape, where it just worked. Yeah. Um, he just, I think Frank, for you know, for whatever faults he had, and for you know how it didn't work, and his inability to adjust without Joseph going into 2020 when he blows the ACL at MLS's back tournament and everything. Um, I feel like Frank DeBoer is that kind of dude who can walk into a room where somebody's playing chess, metaphorically speaking, mm-hmm. and can tell you what the state of the game is and what to do to finish it off. Dude can just look at it and know it. Um, and I think Caleb Porter looked at it last night and knew what to do with it. And I thought Gonzalo Pineda made some changes that some of them worked, some of them didn't. Um, I mean, you did go back and get your second goal. As, and that's some of that is – some of that just comes down to good fight. Some of it is, you know, Franco Ibarra has got to do better when he comes on late in the game because Santi Sosa's poured his heart and soul into this game. Yeah. You know, yeah. Tiago Almada. Like, I don't I don't, I don't want to hear a damn word about Almada for a while. Yeah. Um Amada gave you everything he had in that game, whether it be trying to create, beating guys on the dribble, trying to make something happen, tracking back if he had to. Tiago Amada busted his ass in that game. Like, I, I, I can't, I can't really criticize Tiago Amada for that one. Um, there are guys who, like Luis Araujo, just cannot. I, I still think Luis Araujo is pressing so hard trying to make something happen. He's out there, metaphorically speaking, dragging up threes, trying to get one to fall yeah. instead of just playing um, instead of just playing the game. Just simplify it a bit. Dude, you don't have to do everything. Because I feel like he is pressing the life out of the game, trying to make something amazing. When you don't need amazing, you need good. That's all you need. Go back to doing what you were doing, you know, end of last year, start of this year. Remember, man, scored the first game of the season. Like, go back to that guy. You don't have to be Superman. Uh, Shiva's asking if we can keep this lineup. Basically, with eight matches left, what do we have to lose? But uh, Shiva would like to keep this lineup, please. I mean, yeah, I like it. Um, I'm still I'm, I'm having the image in my head also of Atlanta getting a break in the second half down the left-hand side. Ronaldo Cisneros sitting at the top of the 18 and just sitting on the ball. Mm-hmm. Instead of playing it and just like pulling my hair out of my skull because he had, I think it was Almada or Louise trailing. All he had to do was roll it to the top of the 18. And the guy was going to be like, have a pretty decent shot on goal from the top of the 18. And he just sat there on it and didn't do anything. It's like he froze up. And then by the time they make a play, Columbus had reorganized. So that's also in my head. Um, I was beating my head against the wall in that moment because you had, it was like three on four, but you had Columbus with their backs turned, they were running, they were trying to get organized. All you had to do was lay it off. And Cisneros has got to lay that ball off, man. Like you just have to, but yeah, yeah otherwise I liked the, I liked the lineup. I'm fine with it. If you want to run it out there like that. Cool. And if that means, you know, it's Emerson Heinemann and in place of a Mercedes at times, or Matea Sato in, you got to rest guys and you want to rotate that position. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with that. Um, but if a Marseille is going to do that for you, then yeah, keep running it out there like that. Also, um, as I mentioned this yesterday, uh, Atlanta doing like an aggressive 21st century version of what Scotland does has absolutely sent me to heaven, <laughs> which is um, so Scotland has two world class left backs, Kieran Tierney and, uh, and, and Andy Robertson. Yes. Uh, what they do is they play a three-man back line. They play Robertson on the wing back, and they play Kieran Tierney as a left center back. Mm-hmm. And they both get forward in the attack and cause overloads on the left-hand side, a la Caleb Wiley and Andrew Gutman. Right. And then they rotate everything around that. I- Atlanta doing that would absolutely send me to a higher plane of existence, and I might die from laughter if, if that's what you end up doing, where we're going to keep playing Caleb Wiley on the left wing back role, and we're going to put Andrew Gutman at left center back and just let them both go. Yeah. 
and just and just rotate everybody from right to left defensively to 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 fill in that space as they go forward. Uh, admittedly, when I go through the twitch pitch, it is in a temporal sense. So literally, it is in the order that everything happens. So I'm going to step out of the Atlanta United order quickly here. Bam's in this morning for us, this evening for him. And he says, talk about LAFC throwing a game. Jarrett. <laughs> Look, Bam, I think we talked about this, Bam. Um, I thought it would be a draw. Um, I think I called a draw in that game. I think you because, did. You called because... Wacky. Draw. San Jose has never played a normal game, and I think we talked about this, Bam, with with respect to like San Jose's entire existence is built around making LA miserable, mm-hmm. and that's what they did. And it came down to like the weirdest five minutes of the season, where Cade Cowell puts in a shot that damn near broke the net, and then you get the second yellow card. Which man, that's a second yellow card. Like Ilya can get mad all he wants. Um, he, he, it's not a. I don't think it's a straight red, but he went for the ball. He missed. He stepped on the guy's foot. It's a second yellow card. <laughs> it's, yeah. um, I because I, at first I thought it was a straight red. I was like that's questionable. Then I remembered he had a yellow already. So it's it's that's just, that's that's fine. That's a yellow card. Um, but yeah, their entire existence is just to piss off the LA, LAFC, and I'm I'm very entertained by it. LAFC. By the way, locked up a playoff spot, so they're fine. Yes. Um, they don't care. I'm be interested to see how LAFC balances this going forward um, before Bam goes to sleep, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested to see how they balance this going forward because you have guys like Bale and Chiellini who you're going to want to manage minutes for, but how much do you manage their minutes so that they're kind of game ready yeah. versus you know, resting them so much does less rest lead to rust because they haven't been playing consistently and they're only training. I want to see how they manage this. Do you rest Carlos Vela as well to make sure he's ready for the playoffs, make sure nothing happens because he's kind of been fragile for the last year plus. I am very intrigued by what you do if you are uh, if you are LAFC. Good on oh. them this year because it's a team that missed the playoffs last year. They brought on a new coach this year. They made some changes. They built on what they had. And they showed you that a team that spends money, you know, when they take a step back, and they had injuries last year too, of take a step back and look at it and reload it and go for it big the next year. So it should be a positive for you that you can have a team that has talent and might just need to adjust some things and be able to go for it. But, and this is something I, I think that Bam is probably keeping an eye on as well. Sifu is being looked at by Brighton, and Mamadou Fall is being looked at possibly for a move overseas as well. So R- if, Rich Ransom has some thoughts too. Um, oh, I bet. Yeah, we'll get to about Ransom. about about Philadelphia. Yeah, because you're on. You're you're now officially. I think aren't you officially now in, in CFL parlance at three minute warning before you have to go anyway? Uh, yeah. But go ahead and finish your thought, and we'll hit that. No, just uh, the fact that Sifu and Fall could be on their way out the door in addition to your load management, in addition to the idea that Chiellini might have to play more minutes if Mamadou Fall is out the door. And then, you know, you have possibly losing Sifu to Brighton as well if the money is right. So just, you know, other stuff to look at for the next uh, eight or nine days. Uh, yeah, and what was it? Uh, yeah, no, we play Philadelphia after D.C. again. You don't, you're gonna have if Atlanta wants to even crack the door open here, they're gonna have to go get six points off Philadelphia home and away. Mm -hmm. Um, your task is damn near impossible, um, because of the teams around you who uh, are picking up points. So, you you need a bunch of draws and then you have to go pick up six points consistently. I don't, I don't think you can do it. I think, I I think the universe has told you that this year ain't gonna be it. Um, and they'll keep fighting. I have zero doubt about the fact that they will keep fighting. They have been wildly schizophrenic, though, so I don't know what to what to make of it. We'll just have to go by game by game by game. Uh, Rich, yeah, we can talk about the fact that Philadelphia beat <laughs> DC thirteen nothing over aggregate. Yes. Um, I would also like to talk about uh, why Pro decided that handballs don't matter in that game. You uh, look, you didn't deny DC a win in there. You denied DC the equivalent of a sad field goal, and I'm very disappointed in you. I'm very disappointed in Philadelphia because the only thing funnier than a 13 nothing two game aggregate would have been a 13 one with the little sad field goal. <laughs> and that's the way it was shaping up. But yeah, uh, 
Yeah, D.C., and I, there's some thoughts on D.C. United coming to uh, the bends in the timeline as well. We'll get to that in the Twitch pitch. And just, oh, that's some just classic Atlanta psychology. Oh, no doubt, uh, where it's like, uh, you know, well, D.C. hasn't scored, so of course that means that they're in turn, you know, according to Jason Nix, that means, therefore, that they'll score three and they'll beat Atlanta United. But uh, uh, you are out for the day, is that correct? That's correct. All right, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's what happens when that. Mountain Dew goes the wrong way in the morning. So uh, we will catch up with you uh, tomorrow. Accurate? Sounds good. All right. We'll go over MLS tomorrow. Have a safe one. All right. See you. All right. That's Jared Smith. Jared uh, is uh, done for the day. So it's uh, you and me for the remainder of the show. But before we continue, time to talk about our folks over my left shoulder with the copy that I have here in my hand. Uh, SDH is brought to us by our friends, uh, Eliminai Service. Uh, Eliminized for odor-free, clean, fresh air. The one place you need to go is Eliminized. Deodorizing in closed spaces like houses, apartments, and condos. Eliminized has created a customized solution that eliminizes all organic odors, including those like pet cigarettes and food. Realtors and property managers use Eliminized service uh, to eliminize bad odors to help them sell or rent their homes that much faster. It's a turnkey process, makes it easy to work with said realtors and property managers. Kind of the environment. We like that these days. A very green way of going about things without any kind of toxic residue whatsoever. Different than Febreze or your favorite masking agent because when you go under the sink or into the cabinet, take out the masking agent and spray it in the air, that's all you're doing. You're just masking the odor. You're not attacking the problem all the way down to the molecule as uh, Eliminize does with their proven scientific formula. Pricing one of two ways. Cubic feet or parts per million to come up with a price that is affordable for you, offering results in 24 hours or less. If you have any questions, frequently asked or otherwise, one place that you need to go, it is a Eliminize service. So it is E-L-I-M-I-N-I-Z-E dot com. But do us a favor, after the dot com, go backslash Atlanta. Or is it slash Atlanta? I always get that confused. Anyway, after the dot com, whichever works, slash Atlanta, to let them know what part of the world you are addressing them from to help them attack your problems to keep from finishing a sentence in a preposition. So Eliminize dot com backslash Atlanta. For odor-free, clean, fresh air, Lemonai Service, proud sponsors of everything SDH. And for those of you watching on the Twitch pitch, you got a QR code over my left shoulder that you can hit up as well. So you and me in the Twitch pitch, and then after uh, Twitch pitch, we'll get into news of the day. We'll get into your viewing for uh, later today. Monday Night Football has Manchester United and Liverpool. Monday Night Football over there, Monday Afternoon Football over here. And we'll check the juice boxes and all that and everything else that's going on tonight. And this afternoon, you can keep an eye on. Uh, Let's see. So, yes, Nick's uh, DC is going to smack us 3-0 after getting beat 6-0. Morning to South Georgia. Uh, If the last two were must win, according to the Knicks, then the season is over. It's over, Johnny. Uh, Aliens or uh, uh, Karate Kid? I forget which. Uh, Bart, and I know that Bart has been doing some uh, refereeing discussion in the timeline. Bart, if you're up for it. And you want to have our uh, weekly discussion the Thursday, what did I say? What do we say? Thursday at 930. The Thursday at 930 slot is yours where you can come in and we can have our uh, continual referee discussion about things. And uh, so I'm offering it to you, sir, if you are, if you're up for it for Thursday at 930. Bart says, weird that we had good angles of the incident in the area on Sosa's second goal, but they weren't used to overturn whatever it was that was called. Uh Uh-huh. And but once again, to the the point that I was making in the opening kickoff and and we all need to be vigilant uh, about this, because if Major League Soccer and and I mean more than just more than just fans and, and that kind of thing, it's like we all have to be the press has to be vigilant in wanting a higher standard. Fans have to be vigilant in wanting a higher standard. Bottom line is, is that we have to be vigilant in addressing the issue and and i know that i know that a lot of folks you know it gets tiring but for something that is one of the cornerstones of a sport one of the things that makes the sport go if there are issues that need to be addressed in it we need to be vigilant to continue to address the issues no matter how hard it feels sometimes as we're banging our head against a wall sometimes you know I think that they continue to be vigilant about it to improve the game. So major league soccer can be that top six, top eight league internationally. You've got to continue to, to impress upon those who are in those positions of power, 
that stuff like this has to be addressed. If officials are inconsistent in their call, I get it. That that happens. But to have elements that are egregious that aren't addressed and there's no culpability short of, you know, maybe not having somebody being a VAR and not really saying something about it, if there is a truly egregious moment, then you're not doing the game any good. And so I would just ask, I would ask my peers, I would ask you guys, I would ask anybody that you have conversations with on a, on a daily basis to continue to be vigilant about improving the game. And like I said, Bart, 930 Thursday morning, we can continue to talk about it as well, but just continue to be vigilant about wanting improvement. I'm not going to say change, but I want improvement in the game across the board so it can truly be a great representation of what we do here in North America. And I get inconsistencies, but just improvement to continue to act for accountability in these situations where you're not having Friday news dumps, you're not having Saturday news dumps, you're not having oopsies, these kinds of things. And have an oopsie being treated as an, oh, sorry, you know. We have to continue to be accountable for it. And so that, to me, is just one of the big things that that I would say going forward. I guess that's my siren call for the morning, which I guess brings the uh, opening kickoff somewhat full circle. Just continue to, to call for accountability and improvement. And uh, we'll continue to, to work it that way. Um, Nick's, yeah, play good teams besides D.C. in the running. Can't beat good teams. So, yeah, that was what we were looking at with Philadelphia. Uh, Bart says, really, it's a crime. Dickerson chose to deny Sosa a brace. The man deserved it last night. Santi Sosa, yeah. Santi was on one, and it was fun to see. This is the the Santiago Sosa. Uh, this was the Santiago Sosa that we saw last year at full song, the one that completely and totally sent Blaze Matuidi into retirement with one hip check and uh, one reminder about what Major League Soccer is. That's the Santi Sosa, I think, that we were all looking for. So... That was it was good stuff to see what Santi was up to yesterday. Uh, I know that uh, the Airborne DJ has been having conversations this morning, and I think that this is this is probably true. Under immense pressure next year, if he starts slow, he has to be gone. I think that he'll be under pressure. I don't know what size leash he's going to have, but uh, you know, considering that he would have the team that you hoped that he would have at the beginning of this season, and I think that that's what you're looking at here. I think that. Uh, yeah, so obviously a lot of folks are going to be looking at Gonzalo Pineda, but uh, like I said, so we'll, we'll see with when it's with a team at full song because you know you lose Ozzy Alonso, you lose Brad Gazan, you lose Miles Robinson, you lose that part of your spine, and you're having to resurrect it on the fly. What is it, 20 injuries over uh, 37 players this this past season that, that so far that have been used, multiple players having multiple injuries, so so we'll see. But uh, no, right now the team has continued to fight, and that is definitely something that we have seen going forward. Uh, crew having Miami twice, according to Bam, helps Atlanta. True. And I know that we're probably all going to sit there and look at combinations and permutations and see what's going on with uh, uh, Atlanta United. Turner, that's the schedule makers. I don't know why uh, Atlanta hasn't played Philly yet. Maybe they thought that uh, they would want to, to have something like that for those TV events late in the year. So you're trying to, to backload something akin to a TV schedule. So we'll see. Uh, then uh, great conversation. That's the other part of this that I like to see on a, on a daily basis. The fact that you guys are having conversations with each other about all the topics that we have here in the Twitch pitch. I think that that's very cool that you guys are sharing your thoughts of uh, everything that's going on. Sharif missed the part of the game where the Sosa goal was denied. Is there a link somewhere where it was recorded and can see what you guys and gals are talking about? I'll look back and see. And if everybody has been helping Sharif, uh, then that's great. But there's probably a, uh, a an extended highlight package somewhere where uh, we can see uh, what's what the extended look of that is. But uh, yeah, so that's definitely one. Uh, let's see, Miles and Gazan, according to Emilio, uh, Miles and Gazan won't be back until May or June, probably not at peak. So I'm expecting a slow start. So how does that affect Pineda's leash? Don't know. It would be uh, with everybody else around him as well. Because remember, you're going to have Gutman back. You're going to have uh, Brooks Lennon at full song. You know, you're going to have uh, Tiago Almada in from the beginning of a training camp and having that forward with uh, 
with uh, Marcelino and Luis and the, the firepower up top and uh, with uh, Joseph and possibly Ronaldo Cisneros. And so uh, you're looking at you're looking at the the midfield positions with uh, Mateus Osechu, Emerson Heinemann. And so we'll see. But uh, I don't know how it would affect his his leash if you don't have Miles and Gazan. But we have seen that Brad uh, Miles is doing some cushioned uh, exercises. And we're seeing that the, the mini series that uh, Atlanta United has been putting together, that Brad is now doing some treadmill work, I guess, in a vacuum. And so that way it's it's keeping the, the pressure off his Achilles, too. Uh, Bart, once again, and he says, uh, as Bart has been very busy this morning, I will again reiterate that at some point you are what your record says you are, a team that can play really good soccer. We're a team that isn't capable of winning consistently, a .26 win percentage this year, just not a winning team at all. Uh, let's see. Knicks, clearly Atlanta took a big gamble bringing in a head coach that had never done that job before. I think he's shown he isn't ready for that position. Uh, I get it. The injuries will keep him from getting sacked this winter, but I don't see any reason to believe it will be different next year. Uh, Knicks, you know, when you are a lead assistant for one of the more consistently successful franchises, there's always going to be that moment where you have uh, a coach who's been an integral part of that success, who's ready for that next step. And so I think that you know, what we've seen from Gonzalo Pineda and his staff that he has assembled is a, a team that wants to continue. You know, they want they want the fight. They want to show what they can do. And so I would disagree. I don't think it was a big gamble at all because, I mean, think about it in other sports. I mean, you've seen it with Chicago and Ezra Hendricks in this season. There's always going to be that time. Think about it from college football. I don't think it was a big gamble to bring in a Gonzalo Pineda because of what he meant to Brian Schmetzer with their successes in Seattle. And there's always going to be that moment where, okay, I think I'm ready to, to take the next step. And, and I think that you look at the philosophy that we have with Atlanta United and Gonzalo Pineda was ready to take that next evolution of it with his own twist and, and see what we have. But I think that, you know, everything that we've talked about all season long have contributed to the, the win-loss record where they are right now. And in college football, there's always that hot assistant coach. In the NFL, there's always that hot assistant coach. So it's not necessarily, I don't think it's a big gamble to bring in someone like a Gonzalo Pineda to, to do those kinds of things. And we can continue to have this conversation back and forth. But now there's always going to be that number one assistant that, I mean, he was the, one of the top assistants in Major League Soccer that folks were looking at that was ready for a head coaching position. But I don't think Atlanta United took a big gamble in bringing in a Gonzalo Pineda because he's familiar with the league, familiar with the, the way things are run, familiar with the players, familiar with uh, markets and, and opposition and things like that. And then that way, you know, you're going from bringing in a Gabriel Heinze, who uh, philosophically was once again uh, an evolution of what we had seen from coaches past. But, you know, he came from South American soccer. And so when you have someone who's close to knowing what it, it means in major league soccer. I think that having those associations help and those relationships help with bringing in players from Liga MX, like a, a Purata and a Gudinho and having those relationships, you know, help out as well. And we've seen what having someone like a, a, a Juanjo Purata uh, can do for the back line for Atlanta United. So uh, I don't think it was a big gamble, but uh, once again, you know, that's the beauty of this conversation is that you and I can have this conversation and continue to go back and forth about it all the way through. Uh you, let's see. Um, uh, Tom says, uh, heard of Lalas last night make the point that Atlanta United shouldn't be a place where gaffers get on the job training. I hadn't thought about it that way, but he's spot on. It, it's, you know, I don't think that it's on the job training. It's just a change in his, do it's just a change in the business card. And I know that head coaching is responsibilities and things like that, but you know, if you're, looking for something domestically for someone who's an individual to make that next step. And, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be the the guy that sees something like that. So no, that's, uh, you know, I get where Lawless is coming from. I do, but uh, I don't think that, like I said, I don't think that this was the big gamble to, to bring in a Gonzalo Pineda because you have what we have seen this staff attempt to accomplish with everything going on around them. So, uh, what I'm looking forward to is the same thing that I'm look that I looked forward to before the season started, 
was a full training camp with everybody at full song and, and everyone healthy and another full season with Gonzalo Pineda and his staff and what they want to accomplish and those kinds of things. And so that's what I'm looking forward to once the season is over, whenever it's over that, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to a, an off season and a training camp and everything evolving with everyone healthy moving forward. So uh, that's where, that's where we are with that. Uh, let's see. Uh yeah, uh, Pineda, let's see. Nick says Pineda came from a team that was constructed, managed very differently than Atlanta United. Uh, what do you mean, Nick? I, I just, it's like when, what what specifically do you mean when it comes to constructed and managed very differently? Uh, so just let me know what you, you think about that. Uh, let's see, more conversations. Can't beat teams under the best circumstances. Yesterday we had to beat Pro and Mother Nature too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is with Mother Nature in Columbus and Atlanta United. So, uh, Bam, I don't know if it, Ted Uncle has a petition for him to be removed as an MLS ref from 2018. Did not know about that. Uh, Bart, uh, we can talk about VAR and refs all day, but the fact remains we still give up goals like a Chick like a Chick Fil A gives away sauces, just there for the taking. Um, are they? I mean, I always ask. I I don't know. I guess I always ask for the sauces with Chick Fil A. I always ask when I get there uh, for like all the extra sauces, so I'm not having to go back to the back to the counter and back to the counter and back to the counter. I always ask for extra sauce. Really struggle to put this solely on any one player because other teams disorganize us so easily. Um, and I would posit that a lot of that has to do with the combinations that, uh, I mean, yesterday's yesterday's back line for uh, Atlanta and uh, Columbus was – a lineup of, quickly at the back, Brooks Lennon, who is uh, coming back from injury, Andrew Gutman, who's coming back from injury, uh, Alan Franco, and Juan Hopurata, who is, uh, you know, still, what, six weeks, uh, six weeks, two months for, from being here. And so you're still trying to get those with, with uh, all of these guys. You're still trying to get those relationships together. So, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I, you were caught and run a play, and it was two half chances, and they were done back to back pretty much a couple of minutes apart. And so that's uh, that's how you end up getting two goals scored on you. Uh, Nile, defending has to be better, but if offensively we look promising, yes. Uh, Tom, sadly, it doesn't appear that Joseph has 2017 to 2019 Joseph in him anymore. No, and I think that uh, multiple knee surgeries will do that for you. And so, how does. Uh, Joseph's game evolve and what's the next step in it. I think that that's the, the next stage here. When you look at uh, somebody like a Joseph Martinez, what does, what does Joseph do going forward and how does his game continue to, to change and evolve? Uh, Nile love the response from Atlanta. Doesn't really change their spot in the playoffs. Unfortunately, no, not at the moment. I uh, have to be more clinical. Yep. Cisneros. We talked about that before Jarrett left this morning. Uh, thinking that, uh, uh, let's see, Bart to Shiva. I think that it might be an issue, but if the coach realizes or instructs the team to focus on attacking, he needs to provide defenders better instructions to solve the defensive problems we continue to have. Uh, could be a good thing we play. This is from Nile. Could be a good thing uh, we play a D.C. United team that conceded six to Philly. Also could be bad as they'll be hungry for a result. Yeah, D.C.'s in a world of hurt. They've given up 55 goals this year, but uh, – it will uh, definitely be a, a bit of an adventure with DC coming to town to see what version of DC we get. Wouldn't surprise me once again if they just packed it in, tried to get a point, and tried to get out of town just to kind of sit there and it's like, yep, you want the ball here, take it, and then try not to do anything with it. Uh, also, uh, DM Tim forgot about Hyman. Do we have a timetable for him? I have not. I have not seen a timetable for uh, Emerson Hyman. So we'll keep an eye on that and see. I think at the time it was, uh, I think it was four to six when he was on the shelf. So we have a couple of weeks before uh, Mo could be back uh, as a part of the 18s. Tom's fear about DC: they've yet to score a goal under Rooney, which means they're probably doing put up a four spot against us. Right? Okay. Uh, same with Knicks as well. So the Knicks is bracing for it. Uh, we talked about Rich's uh, 13 nil aggregate on DC. Uh, Looking, Bam is looking for a full lineup for LAFC this week away to Austin. I think that you'll get that. Uh, Shiva, not sure clinching playoffs so early is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, you know that LAFC is going to be chasing after Supporter Shield and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, that's the thing. You know, we talk about load management. We talk about all these veterans. Talk about new dudes coming in. 
and we talk about guys going out. This kind of chaos toward the end of an international window. We'll see what happens with LAFC. Uh, let's see. Rich says you have the game circled with Philadelphia. Not a surprise. Uh, so, Bam, you say that fall to Villarreal will be a great move for him. Sifu's hit his top in MLS and needs to move. So, uh, there you go. Uh, Shiva, you have to admire and respect the team for pushing to make the playoffs and Pineda believe they can. I just don't see it. It's too late. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, is that you have to just continue to push. You can't just sit there and, you know, wave the white towel and throw it away and do whatever. You still got to keep pushing until there is no more push. And, and that's why when folks ask me about it, I'm, I'm just, I look at things mathematically and it's just, and pragmatic, I guess is probably the word to use is that. Until there is no chance, there is still a chance. And so you just have to take care of your business. You can't focus on everybody that you've got a hopscotch and all that kind of stuff. So uh, that's just me personally. I think that until there until there is no chance, it's very Yoda-ish, but until there is no chance, there's always a chance. And the fact that these guys continue to, to push and they don't quit, I think it speaks volumes for uh, what the staff and what these guys believe in that locker room. Uh, Bam also got to remember we're meant to be getting Tello for three years. That is true. And uh, getting him, it'll be interesting. Yeah, Rich, boo the Auburn Cup. Uh, this is from the boss, by the way. This is uh, part of the boss's collection when we go on uh, Saturday afternoons. So then, uh, Rich, who's your who's your team? So uh, give me give me the answer while I'm taking another sip of Mountain Dew. Um, Niall says uh, he thinks next season the universe willing will be better for us. And I think a lot of United fans, uh, Niall, are right there with you. Uh, Bam, just read Sifu has Leeds, Brighton, and Newcastle looking at him. Hope he goes to Brighton out of those three. Uncle, next season's another rebuilding season. I don't think it's rebuilding. I just think that it's a season where everybody's healthy. And you pray that uh, you don't have – and, I mean, think about it. Think about how Atlanta United was in those first handful of matches when you had Ozzy Alonso in the lineup. And he was there because Santi was injured. But if you have a guy like Ozzy Alonso as your six, who was that sandpaper for you, and you know he could either be a that starter and have Santi fill in if Santi was still trying to to find his sea legs from injury, or uh, you know be the guy to lock things down in that final twenty or thirty. You know, having that Sosa Alonso pairing at the six, a lot of folks were looking forward to seeing how that was going to work. But with Santi injured, Alonzo had to start, and you saw what he was, what he meant to the lineup. Unfortunately, he gets injured, and then his season's over. But you saw in those first matches what he meant to that uh, to the back for Atlanta United. So uh, I'm looking forward once again to see what uh, what Ozzy looks like in training camp. Once the knee injury and the rehab are behind him, I'm looking forward to seeing it. So. Uh, you know, looking forward to see what Ozzy brings to the table again starting next season. Uh, Niall says this team at full strength, I believe, can be successful with some adjustments. Don't think the roster needs to be burned to the ground. I agree. And once again, it's just making sure that everyone is is the biggest thing for me. Everyone healthy, everyone at 100 percent or whatever the top ranking is in health when it comes to playing uh, PS3 or whatever the kids do these days when it comes to soccer. Make sure that your health and welfare ranking is it 98, 99, 100, whatever it is. Everybody healthy, all things being equal. Get that group together and push forward and then figure out what you may need to do when it comes to, to depth pieces and filling out your 18 and filling out your roster, those kinds of things. So uh, conversation between Niall and, and Bam about Sifu and saying it's Brighton. Uh, Abby, don't think there'll be many changes at season's end. We just need to be more healthy. Yeah, correct. Uh Emilio, need to keep possession under 55%. See Seattle in yesterday's games. You know, Emilio, when it comes to possession numbers, possession numbers specifically, I don't think a certain percentage yields itself to a certain amount of success. So, I mean, just look at, you know, look at Atlanta and Red Bulls. I mean, Red Bulls don't want the ball. They had, what was it, 27% possession against Atlanta United. Of course, when you have a 2-0 lead and you just kind of want to sit there and it's like, yep, y'all can have it. Don't want it. Red Bulls don't want possession. They want to kick it long. They want to press you, create short fields, create opportunities, and go and put it in the back of the net. That's just what they want to do. I don't think possession numbers are specifically tied to a level of success. 
Uh, 55 seems to be about the sweet spot. 55, maybe 60 sometimes, depending on the opposition and depending on if you're at home or not. But I don't think there's a direct correlation between a specific point of possession number and whether or not you're going to win or, or lose a match. It's, it's take it into the context of the opposition and the particular match that you're playing plus the matchup that's there. So that's what uh, that's that's how I look at, at uh, time of possession, almost like in college football, where you've got teams that run spread and teams that run the ball. If a team that runs spread doesn't have the majority of the possession, but they've also scored 28 points or whatever, and the other team running the football is having to pass to try to come back on the team that really isn't running possession and those kinds of things. I just it, look at look at each match within its own context to see about possession numbers and see about level of success. I just don't think that there's a direct correlation between the two. Uh, Niall, Manchester United, but yet I'm still anxious as a Liverpool fan with how poor of a start it's been. You'll be better. Liverpool will be far better than Manchester United. We'll, uh, we'll obviously we'll get into the juice boxes there in just a little bit, but no, I think that uh, you'll be fine. I think that Manchester United and Eric Ten Hag are the ones that really have to worry when it comes to what you're looking at right now. Uh, Shiva thinks there need to be one or two more veterans at least, and uh, where specifically Shiva would you would you have those uh, veterans? Would you have them? I guess midfield and backline. Is that what you're looking at? Let me know. Uh, Brad. Uh, Abby, uh, glad goose. If I could get my upper plate to work this morning, glad goose was in the locker room yesterday. Uh, Nile, I think another midfield signing along with maybe a forward of the biggest priorities also maybe center back, uh, goose and Ozzy. Great. I just have to think we need one more on the back line. Uh, what are every, okay. Bam. Uh, what are everyone's thoughts on the Leon fans protesting about players wearing green boots? And so, okay, let me, let me look about, let me get the details on this because I want to get this right. Uh, Leon fans protest against players wearing green boots. Now, this is from our friends at Get Football News France. During their 4 1 win, a home win over Troy, Leon fans notably unfurled a banner protesting against their players wearing green boots, a color which is invariably linked to their historic rival, Saint Etienne. Club had last week shared training images which showed the likes of Malo Gusto and Ryan Cherky with the boots, which are part of a new Adidas line, with several fans expressing their disapproval on social media. Friday night fans, ban fans banner read, respect our traditions, calling for an outright ban on the color. As well as the young right back, the boots were also being worn by Carl Toko Ekambi, as well as Tete, who scored a double registered and assist. Former striker Sidney Govu also reacted, pointed out that he'd worn green boots for one match in three training sessions before manager and Lyon legend Bernard Lacombe told him to throw them away. Gusto has lightheartedly asked Adidas for a red and blue pair, although it remains to be seen whether the brand will release a version of the new line in Lyon's colors. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I understand it. Um, I, I Bam, I know that, I, I guess Bam, let's put it this way. If you saw your players wearing boots that had blue, yellow, and white, how would you feel? And I guess that's probably the best way to describe it. It's like Atlanta United if somebody was wearing purple boots. I get it. I completely get where the Lyon fans are coming from. And I know that, uh, you know, it just takes a just takes a little foreknowledge for something like that. So I'm, uh, you know. I, I understand where the Lyon fans were coming from with that. So definitely, definitely. Um, okay, so three years, uh, Uncle, uh, three years is tiring. It's exhausting. Uh, Niall, really hope Joseph can get back to his form. Hate to see him like this. 3TH, uh, biggest offseason question is going to be forward, be that Joseph regaining form or otherwise. Uh, Emilio, don't see what can be done. Uh, this is uh, the officiating question. Uh, owners can do more than fans. Well, that's true, but at the same time, you know, I think that you look at, you know, hue and cry, and I think that there's something, I think that there's something to that, and I think that it's almost something of a cause and effect, where if fans hold media accountable, then the media can hold the game accountable, and then the fans can hold the game accountable, if that, if that makes any sense. So it's almost like a transitive property of accountability. I think that it's, 
you know, we talk about rising tides lifting all boats. I think that if the fans and the media sit there and continue to, to, you know, impress upon folks, this is what needs to be done. I think that you can only hear those sirens so much. And then you would hope that there is some kind of accountability from the, the league side to pro to sit there and it's like, you know, yo dog, you know, we got to do something here where it's not a Mike Dean situation where Dean, who is on VAR for the Kukurea hair pull, uh, goes on the four letter newspaper plus for his paid gig there and admits an oopsie where the PGMOL, the, uh, the officiating group attached to the Premier League doesn't say anything about it. And so I think that that is uh, that is just as bad, if not worse, in a situation where something happens like that. But no, I think that if we all, and this, and you know, like I said, this might be Pollyanna ish, I don't know. But I think that if we, we hold each other to a higher standard, that you would want to achieve that higher standard. So let me, if that makes any sense, let me know. And then, like I said, it might be Pollyanna-ish on my part, but that's just my own thoughts on the whole thing. Uh, agreed, Abby, that uh, Santi was man of the match. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bart, not to be a negative Nelly. That's that's me when I'm saying uh, bad things. I'm the negative Nelly here. Don't work yourself into a tizzy trying to figure out playoff scenarios. The only scenario matters is for us to win home games going forward, nipping wins on the road, something this team's not capable of doing right now. It's okay. Just accept we'll miss the playoffs. Um, I'm still going to work with math, Bart, until there is no more math. Uh, Shiva and Uncle, once again, think it's a gamble going for a top assistant. Some do well and some don't. Uh, Isn't uh, Steve Chirundolo from Shiva? Uh, first time coach and he's, he's doing well, but uh, Shiva, I mean, he has coached first team in other places. So, I mean, he's uh, uh, let me check Steve, Steve Chirundolo really quickly. So I think if I'm not mistaken, he had some, uh, yeah, he was in the Hanover. Yeah. So his first gig as it's his first, uh, Head coach of peer, uh, head coaching experience in Major League Soccer. He was the head coach of Vegas Lights in USL before that. He was assistant in Germany from 2014 to 2021. So it is his first uh, head coaching gig in uh, Major League Soccer, not his first head coaching gig, period, because the, the, the line of succession they thought pretty much was going to be in place with Chirundolo coaching Vegas Lights and then succeeding uh, Bob Bradley at that time. So it, it was, you know, Get your get your stuff done there in the, in the second division, and then you uh, get up to the first division. And so, uh, yeah, any coach can do well or not. Yeah. So I mean, but that was his first time. That was his first time head coach in a first division setup. He was head coach in the second division last year. Uh, and so there you go, Bam, uh, with the the fill ins with the assistant coach. Uh, Uncle, definite rebuilding. No, I don't think that Atlanta United is rebuilding. Uh, roster there will be turnover probably to what extent I don't think it will be rebuilding and you're probably bits and pieces here and there and uh, we'll see where it goes from there thank you Bart PS5 thank you uh, so back and forth once again continuing with uh, all of you guys talking about head coaching stuff once again I love that and I love the the fact that you guys are going back and forth I really I really think that uh uh that, you know, when you guys have conversations, it, it pushes all of us forward and pushes us all to think. And I think that that's really cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, continued conversations about stuff uh, all across the board. And then uh, Bart saying that uh, we can't just make referees better. And this is true. And so, Bart, uh, I'm going to basically hold you to this paragraph. And if you're up for a Thursday at 930, which is your open siren call, just can't make referees better. And this is what I want to get in with you on Thursday. I have to be coached, instructed, and held accountable because you are our resident official. And this is why I want to get into this. But that doesn't mean they're not, that doesn't mean they're docked pay or forced to sit. It just means giving honest assessments as well as taking good and taking in good faith feedback from coaches and team personnel. So that's. I want to get into referee development with you on Thursday and just the perceptions and development and all those kinds of things. So um, to just save that paragraph, bring it with you on Thursday, and we'll discuss it 
uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, Uncle, the way forward through the front office, taking an honest look at the players, making serious changes. Midfield's overpaid and underperforming. I would disagree on the whole. Uh, have a lot of overinflated salaries need to be cut down. Once again, that's something that they'll look at in the offseason. So uh, on the whole, the midfield overpaid and underperforming. Uh, Marsadich is not overpaid. I think Franco Ibarra is not overpaid. But like I said, I know that we can get into the discussion back and forth about all this kind of stuff. Uh, Burned. Welcome back, Burn. Good to see you. Steve Tarangelo should have gotten a head coaching gig at Hanover 96 a while ago, but that club is super dysfunctional at a Schalke level. And that's why he left to Stuttgart, ironically, where he also didn't get a shot. He was overdue to get that level job somewhere where he worked his way up the German coaching ladder properly. So there you go. Burn, thanks again for uh, the the perspectives that you always give on all these kinds of things. Um, all right. So let's get into uh, stuff. Let's get into stuff today. So uh, news in and around, and we'll go to the the papers and we'll... Look at uh, all of the news that has been going on there. Once again, this is stuff overseas. And we'll get into uh, what you're looking at over there, avoiding the three-letter and the four-letter paper, because once again, we'll keep an eye on this for like the next eight or nine days when it comes to the the window closing. Uh, According to our friends at The Guardian, Manchester United reportedly set to block a transfer exit for Harry Maguire after Chelsea made a shock inquiry. I know a lot of Manchester United fans who'd like to sit there and just say, uh, Harry Maguire, there's the door. That's interesting. Uh, once again, avoiding the four-letter paper, uh, Daily Telegraph, Manchester United pursuing PSV's Cody Gakpo in parallel with IX's Anthony, unlikely to sign only one of the forwards before the transfer window closes. Villa set to sign Watford winger Ismail Sar. Once again, avoiding the three-letter paper. The Times, Kieran Trippier insisted he was not the kind of player to deliberately hurt another professional after his challenge on Kevin De Bruyne brought a straight red card overturned by VAR. I thought it was a yellow. I didn't think it was a red. So I think the fact that it was overturned was uh, about par. Uh, Daily Express, Manchester United set to make a final push for Frankie de Jong at Barca. Hopes of unveiling Casemiro before Monday night football with Liverpool appear to have been derailed by visa issues. Newcastle now placed an offer worth 25 million pounds plus add-ons for Joao Pedro in a deal that could be concluded this upcoming week, according to reports in Brazil. And uh, Ruslan Malinowski has reportedly been told he can leave Atalanta by manager Jean Piero Gasparini with Spurs sniffing around a potential summer transfer. Uh, according to the Athletic, and once again, uh, go ahead and read uh, David Ornstein's stuff, the, the Mondays, the Monday column that he gives. Uh, that that'll give you all the info that you need. Uh, struggling Leicester City's need for fresh reinforcements could see them soften their stance on Fofana's potential move to Chelsea. And once again, remember, Wesley Fofana has said that he thinks that Leicester might be pricing themselves out of Fofana moving. So we'll keep an eye on that. And then for the daily record, uh, Ange Postacoglu says Celtic can't stand still as he revealed a, new, a deal for Sead Haksabanovic Haksa is almost done. Wow. Sead Haksabanovic. We'll get that done sooner or later. So that's... Uh, that's your quick tour of the papers. Now let's look at what's going on viewing wise today. So uh, today's matches, and once again tomorrow, we'll uh, ca- uh, take a look at what happened in and around Major League Soccer. And we'll take the tour of the league tomorrow. But uh, we've had a lot of stuff going on. You have Eastern Europe. You've got a lot of the European leagues working. Super League from Turkey is at twelve fifteen. You've got matchups there. National League Serie A is at 12.30 with Roma and Cremonense. Obviously, Roma, a large favorite there. You can probably catch that one on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, also, uh, you've got uh, Eastern Europe kickoffs l- lending their way in through the middle of the afternoon. Uh, Premier League 2 is going on alongside the Premier League. You know, it comes to kickoff time, South America. Premier Division is going on in Uruguay and a bunch of other places. League 2. Sampdoria and Juve is at 245 in Serie A. Sampdoria is a plus 500, basically, in the juice boxes. Juve is a minus 161. Your juice boxes currently for Manchester United and Liverpool is, uh, right now, Liverpool at a minus 145. Manchester United a plus 374. Your draw is a plus 336. Also, you're looking at... 
Uh, the Liga Profesional in Argentina has 330 kicks. Bonfield Rosario Central is at 330. La Liga is at 4 Eastern with Girona and Hitafe. Girona is a plus 160. Uh, Racing Club in San Lorenzo is at 6 o'clock tonight. You've got to the Liga MX Femenil at 6 o'clock with Toluca and Juarez. More stuff in Uruguay, Serie A in Brazil, and uh, work its way through. So Monday night football uh, here in this hemisphere is a uh, doubleheader ending at 10 o'clock with Mazatlan, Monterrey, Club León, and Atletico San Luis. So uh, you're looking at uh, a lot of action tonight when it comes to uh, a lot of different places. And let me see. Let me check the viewing habits quickly before we go and tell you where you can watch all of the action that you can. And uh, if it's on Fanatis, you can go to fntz.co uh, slash soccer down here to get all of the uh, all of the action from Fanatis. And I have been hooked when it comes to uh, Fanatis. So, okay, so Super League at 245 is on BN. Your ESPN has the uh, La Liga at 2 and 4. They have uh, La Liga Smart Bank at 4 o'clock. Uh, Paramount has the Argentine League all day and all night. The Brasileiro at 7 o'clock and Serie A at 12.30 and 2.45, and you've got uh, Manchester United and Liverpool at 3 o'clock. So that is your viewing habits for the day. And I think that, uh, once again, thanks to everybody who is having conversations in the timeline. It's great to see you guys back here on a Monday. And later today on the network, just so you know, we will have an interview up with uh, our friends at uh, USL Wilmington. They announced that they are getting closer and closer to putting a franchise together in Wilmington, North Carolina. Is it the return of the Hammerheads? We'll ask Dewan Bader and find out what's going on there in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, as USL is adding cities. So we'll catch up with our friends at USL Wilmington later on this afternoon. Tomorrow, once again, you'll get the USL programming on the network. You'll get Prem and Proper uh, coming up on the network as well. Uh, it's 1230. Okay, so Bam, you are 14 hours ahead. Good to know. So Bam, uh, we're signing off, so we'll catch up with you tomorrow. Thanks to everybody who has uh, been a part of all of this stuff all week long. It's a very, very busy week. Uh, Wild Heaven, I think, is on Wednesday, if my calendar is correct. And so getting ready for D.C. and Pittsburgh on the weekend for the twos and for Atlanta United. So for everybody here at SDH, it is for uh, Jason. For Nick, for Jarrett, I'm just John. Thanks for hanging out with us for once more here at Soccer Down Here, which means we do this.